with us as we sing Open Our Eyes. first. Now if you do know the Alleluia Descant, feel free to sing that with us on the second and third verses. morning is Have Faith in God, which some of you may know and some of you may not. It's from the 90s. So uh, we hope that you can sing along with us. Um, and if you don't know it, then just try your, try your best and I'm sure you'll pick it up.
人。Good morning, church. Does everybody know what these are? No, maybe. For those that were here six months ago, I think it was the 30th of March or around that time, um, we extended the invitation for everybody to um, write out prayer requests to hand them in and the prayer team was going to be praying over those prayer requests. We never opened them up, but we prayed over them. And every single week our church has been praying for these prayer requests. Um, we're going to have a final prayer today corporately for these requests and you're going to get these back. And so we have, I think it's 135 prayer requests here. And I think it's, well, that's when I counted back in the 30th of March. I think a few more have slipped in since then. So we roughly have between 130 and 140 odd of these prayers that have been lifted towards heaven every single week as we meet as a prayer ministry team. So we're going to have a special prayer for that. So I'm going to put these in the, the bag, the golden bag that we, we've had them stored in, which is representative of the, the, the golden censer in heaven. And before we have that prayer, I'm going to invite Sharissa up. Now, you may have seen in your bulletin that um, Sharissa Fong is preaching today. However... Um, it's no longer Sharissa Fong. Do you want to explain what happened? Good morning, everyone. I just want to explain that I got married. <laughs> and so if you open your bulletin, my husband is in the bulletin. And if you open the bulletin, you'll see on the uh, AYC section there, he's the bottom left, far left, Justin Tarosian. So I'm now Sharissa Tarosian. And I remember last time that you were up here, you spoke at a leadership weekend and you were talking about weddings. And so for those that can put two and two together, there was a wedding, oh, the wedding banquet in heaven you were talking about, but you were getting excited about your wedding as well. So um, promises made, promises kept. <laughs> um, just a couple of questions, uh, Sharissa, so the, the congregation is acquainted with you. Uh, what is your role in the conference here? Yes, so I'm currently serving as the prayer coordinator for the North New South Wales Conference. And you might ask, what does that mean? And it's a role that's continually developing, but I'm supposed to be looking after all the prayer ministries um, at Big Camp, encouraging those looking after the prayer conference, and encouraging local churches like yours to pursue a vibrant, active prayer ministry. And I was really excited, uh, actually just now again, when I saw this, and you explained what this was, and also to see that this church has a very active prayer ministry in the bulletin. It looks wonderful. So I just praise God for that. And I guess with the prayer conference that runs every year, um, I know that there's a number of, of members from our church community here that have attended that over the years. Um, who attended it this year? I know that the school actually had an initiative where the, the staff... Just raise your hand. Um, so there's, there's a few people from the congregation here that attended that. Now, I was thinking this week, and I haven't told you about this, but I was thinking, what would it look like if we had 50 people from this church go to the prayer conference? Like, what would that look like? Um, what blessing would come? Because I know that the school and the staff were blessed as they attended the prayer conference. And I just really want to encourage the, the church community um, and kind of give them a bit more information about this prayer conference, when it's run and where it's run, and how they can register if they'd like to attend. Well, I'm very excited to hear that this is a passion of yours too, Pastor Ash. Um, the prayer conference is set for 2020 in the first weekend of March, March 6th through to 8th. So you might want to block that off in your calendars. And I'm going to give you guys details that we haven't given to anyone else. Um, the theme for 2020 is He Promised. Now, I don't know if you realize, but every promise in the Word of God furnishes us with subject matter for prayer. If there's a promise here, God wants us to pray it back to Him, to claim it by faith, because God will keep His promises. That was an amen moment. I couldn't do my fist pump properly, but you can say amen to that. So, uh, we are 
we're gathering together that first weekend of March and the prayer conference will be happening at Stewart's Point, which is like the midway point for everybody in this conference. And I want to urge everybody and encourage you, if you seek a spiritual revival, if you want to gather together and pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit with others from around this conference, then I urge you to join us and to mark that off in your calendar. The website registration is not open yet, but it will be open within the next few weeks. So we will make sure that you hear about that. Watch this space and by all means, spread the word and tell your friends to join you for this spiritual event. Uh, Mrs. White, she talks about how we shouldn't avoid the gathering together for spiritual convocations or gatherings like this for the purpose of prayer. It's a very wonderful opportunity that we have. So I encourage you to come and uh, you may want to know who the speaker, one of the speakers will be. We had, we were really looking forward to having Pastor Pavel Goya join us and he was going to come but unfortunately that's fallen through. So we're going to have to look forward to him coming another time but we have a fiery preacher who's passionate about prayer coming his name is Sebastian Braxton and I'd encourage you to come along and join us in the word and in prayer as we press together and come for this weekend thank you very much for that Teresa I'm going to invite you all to, to kneel we're going to have a final prayer for um, these prayer requests and you're going to be getting those in this next week but we want to lift them to God one last time so I invite you to bow with me as we pray Father in heaven, we come into your presence here this morning because you have drawn us to this place. Um, you've drawn us here for the specific purpose that we might connect with you. And Father, in connecting with you and in abiding with you, Father, we do bear fruit. Father, not for our glory nor the glory of anyone else, but for the glory of our Father in heaven. And Father, we thank you that we have this privilege of prayer, that we may press close into your bosom that we may open our heart unto you, Father, and that you do hear us. We thank you that you are available. We thank you that you are present. We thank you that you are near. And Father, I know that your heart is buoyed by the number of prayer requests that we have prayed over and that we have sent your way, Father, over these past few months. And Father, I do know that there are prayers in this bag that have been answered. I also know that there are prayers in this bag that have not been answered yet but will be answered in your time. And I also know that there are prayers in this bag that have not been answered. Not because, Father, you don't want to give good gifts unto your children, but because you give those gifts which are in accordance with your will. And Father, my prayer is here today, not only that you may fulfill your will, but Father, that you may give us the capacity, the ability and the understanding necessary to accept whatever that will may be. Father in heaven, I want to thank you that we don't come here this morning to bend your arm and convince you to do something. That's not what prayer is about. But we come to you here this morning and we pray that our hearts may be aligned with your heart and that your spirit may enter into us and to make us new. Father, I pray for every single name represented in this golden bag right here that they may receive not necessarily the thing that they ask but the very thing that they need a greater portion of the Holy Spirit in their lives. I know, Father, without a doubt, because I put my name on one of these letters in this bag and I prayed for people in my family to intercede on their behalf. Father in heaven, every single person is on a journey. And if there are names represented in this bag of, of children or of, of brothers or sisters or spouses or friends or whoever it is that are no longer walking with you, Father, I ask and pray that you may continue to work on their behalf, that you may continue to reach out to them, and that you may continue to move in a powerful way. Father, I also want to uplift in prayer in a corporate way here this morning. Um, and I want to pray, Lord, for, um, for Ethan. Lord, I thank you that you are a physician who has never lost a case. And I thank you that just as you gave sight to the blind and you, you gave hearing to those who are deaf and that you raised the dead to life, Father, I pray that you may place your hand upon him as he goes to surgery on Monday. I ask and pray that you be with Ethan Taylor, Lord, that you be with the surgeon, that you may be with the family. And that, Father, you may send your angels into that place, that you may give steadiness of hand to the surgeon, that you may give wisdom and discernment to all the professionals. 
But above and beyond all of that, Father, I pray for a peace that truly does surpass all understanding to gird the hearts and minds of Matt, Shelley, Ethan and Danny. Father, we thank you that you hear us. We thank you that you are with us. And we thank you that whatever things we ask when we pray, if we believe that we receive them, we shall have them, according to your word, Father, in Mark 11 and verse 24. And we claim this promise only because of the precious name of Jesus in which we pray. Amen. I'd like to take some time now to give thanks to God. Um, about 18 months ago, I am thankful that my dad had a heart attack. Now that might sound a bit strange, but for those who don't know, he is fully recovered. Uh, but Ivan and I were in, living and working in England and uh, we were going along doing our thing. Mum called Ivan. I was at school. I came home from school. Ivan told me Dad had a heart attack. Um, he had a cardiac arrest, but he was in hospital. At the time, they, they were able to bring him back. And this, this event, it sparked um, a whole chain of, uh, of, of events, um, a decision that Ivan and I made to come here to come and spend time with my family first and foremost, but an added blessing to that has been this church and the people that we have met and the people that we have befriended, old friends that we have spent time with. Um, I'm thankful for Sabbath lunches, for Bible studies, for Sabbath school class, um, so many things. Um, I'm, I'm thankful for being able to play the piano in church, which I haven't done for a lot of years. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to, to you um, and thanks to God that, that he brought out the best thing from a potentially really sad event. I won't go on. I could go on, but I won't. Um, is there anyone else? Uh, Nailani has the microphone. I'd like to open it up to anyone who would like to share um, something that they are thankful for um, in recent weeks, um, this year. Anything that you would like to share, to encourage, to, to praise God for today. Nailani? Um, I'm thankful that God's helped my sister and my mum make up after five years of an argument. Um, they actually started talking to each other again um, a couple of months ago and they've been, and um, three conversations later my sister um, said I love you and she hung up my mum which made my mum throw me in tears because she hadn't had that for five years and they were really close growing up so I'm really thankful for God about that. Anyone else? Um, Nailani. I'm just thankful that I'm here today and that I'm not in Syria and we need to cherish the time we have now to study God's word. I've been blessed by studies this morning and that is a great blessing that sometimes we just take for granted. I'm thankful that I've got friends here and to enjoy a happy Sabbath day with them. Thank you. Michelle?
Uh, I'm just super thankful for God because um, I was beyond nervous to be a Bible worker here. Um, but God really blessed me with every single person in this room and um, you've supported me and you've just loved on me and I couldn't thank God enough to be a part of this church. I'd just like to thank God for the Sabbath day. Um, I, know, I know it's very cliche, but... When you have a, a big week, um, I know my husband and I were talking this morning and saying we're praising God that it is the Sabbath where you, you don't feel guilty for taking a break and um, enjoying the day of rest that God's given us. So I'm grateful for that. Last chance. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Um, yes, and I think it's it's good to to express gratitude and to to give thanks to God, and that's that's what I wanted to do today. Thank you. Thanks, Monica and Ivan. You've been a great contribution to the church family even though Ivan buys all the clothes I buy. Same shoes, shirt. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's, we sure are blessed in so many ways. Even though I have the offering prayer, I just want to welcome Dane and Johanna McKay being married. <laughs> <clears throat> Best time of your life, right now. <laughs> <laughs> then you have kids. <laughs> Make sure you have five years without kids and then you'll survive your marriage. Too many people, they just jump straight into kids, not good. <laughs> what are you laughing for, Phil? So we've heard all the blessings that we've received um, and now it's our chance and our opportunity to give back. Um, the offering today is for the local church budget. And um, so if we can all kneel and we'll pray over that. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we could be here for days, weeks, months, thanking you for the blessings that you bestow upon all of us. Um, and we're, they're all free gifts. But right now is our opportunity to give back to you uh, an offering. Part of the church local budget today, Lord, and um, I pray, Lord, that we will all feel that blessing and we'll feel that need to give to you, to the running of this um, great place that we have to come and worship you. Thank you for your love. And um, Lord, I'd also like to just pray for uh, Ethan um, and the Taylor family on Monday, like Ash has. But Lord, just um, I pray that you would take control of the hands of the surgeon in such a delicate little operation. Be with them, be with their family, Lord, and today be with our offering for the local church budget. Amen.
Good morning. In Psalms 46, it says that God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. And in verse 10, it goes on to say, Be still and know that I am God. This is the chapter that the song Still is based on, which we're about to sing. Um, for me, it has two meanings. In this crazy, busy world we live in, which has many competing priorities, it's a reminder that I need continually that the most important priority is to be still and know God and to spend quality time with him. And that's a bit of a struggle when you're a Martha in a merry world. Well, we should be a merry. The other meaning is that when tough times come, really tough times come, and they will, and they do, if we stay close to God, he will help us to weather the storm, to rise above all the difficulties and to keep trusting in him. And just like Jesus commanded the storm on the Sea of Galilee, he will say to our storms and to us, peace be still, I'm with you. Please stand with us as we sing still. Let us open with a word of prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, as we gathered here together in this church this morning to worship you, to be still and know that you are God, we pray that the Holy Spirit would speak very personally to each heart. We pray that Jesus would be lifted up. And I pray, Lord, that we would take something new from this place today, that we would grow closer to Jesus, that our faith would be challenged, and that we would be impelled to go and serve you more faithfully. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever had a time in your life when everything seemed to be falling apart. I think all of us 
can think back to such a time and Ezekiel the prophet in the book of Ezekiel was called to serve God at such a time in history. He was serving God in a time when political decline was very much the reality for Israel. He'd seen the glory of God's temple desecrated as its holy furnishings had been taken to pay tribute to the Babylonians. And then finally to add insult to injury in 597 BC Ezekiel along with the brightest minds in all of Israel he had been carried off into exile in Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar and his mighty army. God's people at this time in history felt as though they had hit rock bottom and been told to dig and given a shovel. And this is where we're going to pick up our message today. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to take them. Come with me. We're going to the book of Ezekiel. We're going to Ezekiel chapter 37, otherwise known as the Valley of Dry Bones. And I think Pastor Ashley mentioned the last time I was up this region of the conference, I preached about getting married. Now I'm preaching about the complete opposite. We're preaching about a Valley of Dry Bones. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 1 and 2 is where we pick up. And I should just say, as you're finding it, I just love your church. I think you've got a beautiful spot here. My first time in Mwollomba, Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is just very beautiful, very special. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed, they were very dry. Now, if there was ever a person in human history who knew that they were in the right place at the right time, it was Ezekiel. By divine mandate, the Holy Spirit has brought him, led him to this graveyard of apocalyptic proportions, a valley not of the shadow of death, but a valley holding the very relics, um, gruesome relics of death itself. He's in the middle of this valley and everywhere as far as his eye can see is not nice green fields like you have around you here, but he sees dead people's bones. This might have been a dog's dream come true, an archaeologist's jackpot, but for Ezekiel this made him very uncomfortable because he was a prophet and not just a prophet, he was a priest. And in the Bible we are told that to touch a dead body would render anybody, but especially a priest, unclean to the extreme. A corpse not properly buried was considered accursed by God. And so as Ezekiel, overwhelmed by this ghastly sight before him, he beholds it in dead silence. And here's the question we ask as we read it. How did these bones get into this valley? Once upon a time, obviously, a tremendous battle had raged in this valley and the bones of the victims were left strewn all over the earth like the fallen leaves of autumn. Silence and desolation now reign in this place. But we need to know that bones don't get very dry like the Bible describes them overnight. Years had passed since the trumpets had sounded the attack and also the retreat. The vultures had done their part. The rains had done their part. The Jews and the snows had all done theirs. Nothing but bones barren and bleached were left of this mighty host. Who were they? Notice what the Bible says in verse 11. The Bible leaves no ambiguity about it. It says, he said to me, this is God speaking, son of man, these bones are what? The whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. These bones represented a spiritually dead Israel held captive by their enemies. And when I hear Ezekiel describe the valley, I confess to you I recognize the landscape. Just recently I had the opportunity to visit um, Inverell. We had a Western Regional out there just a couple of weeks ago. 
and it is so dry out west. I mean, you drive through communities like Gyra, Glen Innes, Inverell, Armadale, it's so dry, everything is dead and barren. And so Australia recognizes this kind of landscape right now. But on a very spiritual level, friends, we live in a society of dry bones, if you will. The Bible says in John chapter 5, verse 12, he who has the Son has life. And he who does not have the Son of God does does not have life. Do we live in a society that upholds Jesus? No, we live in a society that's as dead as dry bones. They've turned their backs on God. They're not seeking Him. They're not pursuing Him. And I want you to know that as much as our culture is pictured in a way as this valley of dry bones, there is also a valley of dry bones in the Christian experience. Sometimes we show up to church every Sabbath. We sit in the same pews with the same smiles. We do the same things every week. We look like we're alive, but really our Christian experience is lacking life. Am I speaking just of myself or am I speaking to you today as well? Do you understand what I'm saying? There is a dry bone valley in our Christian experience as well. And sadly, many... They, they enter into their day every single day without a thought for God, without pausing to offer a prayer of surrender to Him. And they are lured onto a battlefield where just like this army was, was killed and decimated in the Valley of Dry Bones, many are fighting a war they are not equipped for, and so they spiritually die on this battlefield. Life has many ways of drying out our Christian experience. Sometimes our marriages become dry and barren places because Jesus is not at the center of our homes. Sometimes we have lost a loved one. We've gone through a depression because of some, some terrible thing that happened to us in life. A stinging failure, a stinging humiliation, sickness, tragedy, injustice, circumstances beyond our control. These have a way of peeling away our spiritual muscle and flesh until all that's left is dry bones. We may feel dried up here this morning, even as you listen to my voice, but I want you to know that I came to preach the gospel to you today. And the gospel tells us that when things look bad, God is not finished. Keep looking. Notice what it says in verse 3. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. As Ezekiel takes in the scene before him, he hears God whisper an incisive question. Son of man, can these bones live? God's not interested uh, in their grandparents. He's not interested in what church they belong to. He's not even interested in what bones, whose bones they are or what happened to them. He simply asks, can these bones live? Now we need to put this in perspective this morning because perhaps you've read the para this passage before. But if we were walking down the street, the main street in Mwollombar, and we saw a body lying motionless on the ground, you and I would probably think to ourselves, there's hope. And we would rush to try and help them. We would perhaps even start CPR. But if we saw a skeleton lying on the side of the road in Mwollompa, nobody would go and start CPR. In fact, we'd think it's a situation beyond help. Yes? You're very quiet. I'm, I'm taking it that you're all just taking it in. <laughs> so the question in his mind, you know, God asks this question, can these bones live? And Ezekiel's mind runs wild. What does God mean? Are these bones really dead? But as Ezekiel ponders this thought, he remembers the one who asks the question. And so he answers. Presumption might have said, yes, Lord, these bones are dead and they're not going to. Or, or the presumption could have said, yes, Lord, you can make them live. But instead, Ezekiel utters a response of faith and submission. And he says, oh, God, you know. If Ezekiel had responded to God's question based on the evidence of his senses or his feelings, his knee-jerk reaction would have been like ours. No way. Death has won in this valley. He saw nothing in himself, nothing in the bones, nothing in the whole of creation that could reverse their circumstance or produce a change. But Ezekiel knew 
that his God is able to do the impossible. If there's a sea, God will split it. If there's a furnace, God will cool it. If there's a battle, he will fight and win it. When Jesus stood in front of the tomb of Lazarus, everybody knew that the situation was hopeless. That is everybody except for Jesus. For some incredible reason, Jesus believed that the dead could live again. Where God is, when there's no life, there is still hope. And so, I want to speak a word of encouragement to you today. Perhaps you and I are faced right now with hopeless situations and dead situations. Know this, that those situations which you are facing today, they present a field of possibility to God. Today God asks you, can your friend, can your son, can your daughter pursuing the things of this world, can that loved one live again? And the answer is yes. Can that person who seems so indifferent to the love of Jesus, can that person, that church member, the one who has no devotional life, the one just going through the motions, can they live? Can that person who's in a wrong relationship today, can they live today? Some people we pray for over and over again and it might feel like we are wasting our time in praying for these people, but we are not wasting our time. Their bones might scream at us, forget it, this situation is done. But God is not finished today and he is still able to breathe life into that situation. Notice what happens in verse four. It says again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. How many of you young people wanna go on a mission trip? <laughs> Can you, amen, praise the Lord, what a wonderful church. You got young people passionate about mission. I doubt any one of us would wanna go on a mission trip to preach to a valley of dry bones. <laughs> I mean, just imagine it. There are many prestigious places that one could preach in in this world and a valley of bones is not one of them. Friends, this is not a living congregation that God calls Ezekiel to. But Ezekiel goes and God bless him, he preaches. In fact, um, he starts to prophesy and I notice what God asks him to do. God calls Ezekiel into service and he says, preach to the bones. Friends, if Ezekiel had been a teacher, he would have said, teach the bones. If Ezekiel had been a baker, he might have said, bake for the bones. Whatever you do, do it all for the bones and in the midst of the bones, do it for the lost. Here's a quotation. A beautiful one from the Spirit of Prophecy. It says, We are to preach the word of life to those whom we may judge to be as hopeless subjects as though they were in their graves. That's how we minister to the world around us. Notice verse 5. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel was not called to this valley to tell the bones what he thought. Amen. I'll amen myself just because I feel like you're holding your excitement in. Um, do you understand that he was not called to preach what the great scholars of the day thought? He was not called to preach what the theologians said or even to read them the newspaper. When God called Ezekiel, his charge was very simple, preach the word of the Lord. The word of God, as it is studied, has the power to bring life into your experience today. Prayer and Bible study, they go hand in hand. This word is a living thing. The Bible tells us God spoke and the world came into being. That same creative power of God's word is, comes into your heart, comes into your life when we prayerfully open this sacred book. Preach the word of the Lord, for the word of God is living and powerful. And the result which Ezekiel would see in this dry, dead valley would be something for which he was not responsible for, but something which God would do. Verse seven. So I prophesied 
As I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. You know, growing up, when I was a little girl, my parents brought me to church every Sabbath, and I would sit in the pews, and I would think to myself, wow, I wish I could get up the front and preach. And so when the service was over, I would go home, and I would shut myself in my bedroom, and I'd stand in front of our full-length mirror that we had in our room, and I would preach to the mirror. And then my sister joined me one day. She entered the room without knocking, and she said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm preaching. She said, can I play too? I said, all right. So she did the welcome, took up the offering, sang the special music, said the prayer. Then I would preach. Then we would stand together for our closing hymn, and then I would go to the door of our room, shake her hand, and thank her for coming. <laughs> and actually, as part of that routine, we lined up our teddy bears as part of the congregation too, and I would preach to the mirror and to the teddy bears. Well, nothing happened when I preached to teddy bears. <laughs> and actually, Spurgeon, apparently, the great Baptist preacher Spurgeon, oh, I look forward to meeting him one day, but he would go and preach in a cemetery. That was so that he could get away from all distraction. He could preach uninterrupted. When Ezekiel preaches, not in a cemetery, but in the valley of dry bones, when he preaches not to teddy bears, but to a valley of dead, very dry bones, something amazing begins to happen. Hollywood has nothing on this story. In fact, I believe, friends, that if you and I obey God, just take Him at His word and do what He says, no matter how difficult, no matter how much we may not want to, Lord, if we say, I put you first, you and I will be amazed at what God will do when we honor Him like that. It seems at first, Ezekiel didn't even have the courage to look at his congregation when he was preaching, because the Bible says he heard the sound. He heard the sound, then maybe he opens his eyes and he sees a remarkable thing. Suddenly, as if drawn by some invisible magnet, bones are whizzing through the air, joining themselves up to their original places as God begins this amazing process of reassembly. Praise God, there is no audience that is hopeless. <laughs> when God's people preach the truth, something happens. Either it will bring revival, it could bring persecution, it might even bring both. But whatever happens, a shaking will happen when the word is preached. Notice verse 8. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. God speaks, and Ezekiel acts and he preaches and the power of that word he preaches the word of God knits those bones together all 206 of them the knee bone connected to the thigh bone and I can't remember the rest of the song but you know how it goes he keeps preaching and so it was like this wonderful reformation that takes place in the valley and when Ezekiel finished his sermon he looks and something had happened in death valley the valley is full of people now, but I'm not sure if it's much of an improvement. Perhaps Ezekiel even recognized some of the people before him. But instead of being alive, they are now look alive, but they're still dead. They're like a traveling science exhibit, and they're there in the valley. And perhaps Ezekiel's heart, his heart, which had thrilled at the movement as he saw the bones coming together, now sank with great disappointment. And I often think to myself as I read this passage, this is such a picture of the Laodicean condition, where we look like we have it all together, where we look like we're alive, but really we are dead, we are spiritually dead. Have you heard of a man named C.D. Brooks, the great preacher, Adventist preacher? He tells a story, and I liked it, so I wrote it down. He tells a story about a millionaire who was dying and didn't know what to do with his money. And so in his will, he left these instructions that he was to be buried in his brand new Cadillac and that the flower girls should be showgirls from the stage. And the word got out and thousands came to see 
the spectacle when a giant crane lifted a gleaming car into the air with a dead man behind the wheel, lowered it into a hole that had been prepared and scooped out by a bulldozer, and then all the ladies in scantily clad clothing were standing around holding flowers, and there was a jazz band playing. And as people were watching, some unthinking spectator looked at the crane as it lowered the car and said, man, that's living. <laughs> no matter who you are, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus, you are as dead as the dry bones in Ezekiel's vision. Like Israel, we too can look spiritually, uh, we can Look physically alive while being spiritually dead. We are among the living dead whenever our hope is extinguished, whenever our love for God and others grows cold, whenever our faith becomes dull and routine. But there is hope. Like the bones in Ezekiel's valley, we don't just need reformation. We need revival. And more than that, I believe today we need resurrection. Listen to this. This is another beautiful quote coming to us from the Bible commentary. It says this, the Spirit of God with its vivifying power must be in every human agent. Many who are without spiritual life have their names on the church records, but they are not written in the Lamb's book of life. They may be joined to the church, they, but they are not united to the Lord. They may be diligent in the performance of a certain set of duties and may be regarded as living men. But many are among those who have a name that thou livest and art dead. And perhaps as you're listening this morning, the Spirit of God is speaking to you and saying, I want to do a work of revival in your heart today. There is hope. Watch what happens. Verse 9. He said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man. And say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. And so Ezekiel, he calls on the wind. And in the midst of this hopeless twilight, a holy, mysterious, life-giving wind blew through that valley. The word translated breath here in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word ruach, and it speaks of God's divine activity. This wind is none other than the Spirit of God. It's the Holy Spirit. It was the same breath of God that was breathed into Adam's nostrils when God created him in Eden, whispering life into being. It was the Ruach of God, the Spirit of God, who blew like a mighty wind in that upper room on the day of Pentecost. Friends, for us, the wind in the Bible here is not just meteorology or biology. It is theology for us. The stench of spiritual death can only be blown away by the wind of God's Holy Spirit moving amongst us. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives today. We need the Holy Spirit in our church today. And I want you to note that Ezekiel's preaching didn't just bring people to life. It brought them together. When the Holy Spirit is present in the Christian life, there is fruit. And it's not plastic, and it's not fake, and it's certainly not sour. I was talking with somebody who couldn't stand another individual in their church, and they were just going, telling me about how they felt about so-and-so. And I reminded them, I said, well, you know, we can't really say this because we're all going to be in heaven one day. We need to learn to love each other. And this person said to me, yes, but heaven's a very big place. <laughs> there is no room for the bone of contention in the body of Christ. I'm sorry, but that was a bigger amen moment. <laughs> we need to love each other as only God can allow us to do. The converting power of the Holy Spirit, how we need it in our lives today. There was once a man who was killed at a railroad, a railroad crossing one evening in 1891. And so the relatives of the uh, man who was deceased, they took the railroad to court and a trial followed. And the watchman who was supposed to be on duty that night, he was called to the witness stand. 
And the prosecuting attorney asked him several questions and they went like this. Were you on duty at the crossing at the time of the accident? And he said, yes, sir, I was. Did you wave your lantern in warning? Yes, sir, several times. Having answered in the affirmative to every question that was put to him, the railroad won the case. An officer of the railroad came to visit the watchman after and he came to thank him for giving evidence in favor of the railroad. And the officer said to him, tell me, were you at any point nervous when they were questioning you? And the watchman replied, oh yes, I was scared to death at any moment they would ask me if the lantern was lit. <laughs> we can go through the motions of religiosity. We can wave our lanterns wildly, and I'm preaching to myself. But unless we allow the Holy Spirit to live in our hearts and to ignite us with the fire which only heaven can give, we are wasting our time. And there are many souls who would be warned if we were filled with the Spirit of God, who would be saved and turned to God if we were really ignited with the Holy Spirit. So I ask you and I ask myself, do I wake up each day and pray earnestly for the infilling of the Holy Spirit in my heart? Do I ask the God to baptize me with the Holy Spirit? Because some of us can do a pretty good job of covering up our dry bones. But whatever situation you might be in today, God can breathe life into our lifelessness by the power of the Holy Spirit. For it is not by might nor by power, but what? By my spirit, says the Lord. In fact, here's another quotation. It says, these bones represent the house of Israel, the church of God. And I've got this highlighted in my notes and I'll just do this so you know it's highlighted. The hope of the church is the vivifying influence of the Holy Spirit. Verse 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath came into them. And they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding, exceedingly great army. I don't think Ezekiel had any trouble preaching after he had this experience in that dry valley. I think he was looking for every congregation he could. To anyone who would, even if they wouldn't listen, he was stopping people in the street to tell them about God, to tell them about the Lord. And I've I love how that army who had lost their vision, lost their purpose, Ezekiel preaches the straight word of God. He calls for the wind to come. And I can't explain it, but the Bible says that that lifeless congregation stood to its feet, ready to serve. And they became a great army, ready to do the will of God. What would it be if we opened our hearts to the Holy Spirit today and said, Come into my life. Use me in a way that I have not allowed you to do, to use me before. What would it look like to the world? There was once a battle where the Scotch guards were called and he called his elite soldiers to come forward. And the commander said, we have a battle on this front and I need uh, some of you to step forward. It may mean you may never come back. So I don't expect all of you to step forward, just one. He turned his back. And he waited, then he turned around again and he saw that guard in one unbroken line, an impressive unbroken line. And he got frustrated with him. He said, what is this? You are meant to be the, the bravest, the most highly trained, skilled soldiers we have in this country and you're too afraid to fight for your country? And then his assistant said to him, sir, they have all stepped forward. What would it be? if we all open our hearts together to allow God to do something remarkable in our lives. Amen? I'm very excited about the, the possibility. I'm praying that God will raise up an army in this generation. I pray that God would breathe into His church in this generation so that the work can be finished and we can go home. I understand you celebrated a uh, hundred years, is it? Just recently. Praise God for that. But let's not be here for the next 100 years. It's time to be done with these remembrances of things gone. We need to charge forward and move forward as God is calling us to do. How do we raise up an army? Let's look what the Bible says. An army doesn't come because you tell it to come. 
It doesn't come because you send people out. It doesn't come because you organize people into small groups. Very simply, an army comes by the word of God. There was a man in India who wrote to a mission station back overseas and he said, we are having a great revival here. Because <laughs> they were just simply getting into the study of the Bible and they were revived by that. We need to be revivaled as well. And so as I come to the close of this message today, I look at, this, I look at the lives of God's church and I see that never in human history has an army ever been so equipped and armed to the hilt with the best fighting equipment to fight an enemy that has already been defeated and that army with such opportunity, with such um, skill, well, with such weaponry available to them, they do nothing about it. Can these bones live again? Can these bones live again? Yes. Then we need to pray more. We need to pray and look for people that we can share the word of God with, either in word or deed. Because as we do this, God will use us to reach them and draw them to Jesus. And keep in mind, friends, that it's not revival until it moves. <laughs> Had that army just been reformed and stood as nicely formed bodies again, that wasn't revival. Revival means action. Let's not let the devil convince us that it is a revival to lie there whole but with no life. We must have the Holy Spirit. I've said that several times, so I will not say it again. Let's not stop short of what God longs for us in these days. When God says, go ye, I believe he means go me. He's speaking to all of us. The greatest tact needed for evangelism today is contact. And you might say, Sharissa, I don't feel equipped. That's okay, because it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And so, beloved church, I want to challenge you to read your Bibles full, to read the Word of God and pray yourself hot and go wherever God may send you. You may be sent to the top of Mount Carmel, and your humble offering may rest on cold stones drenched in water. Baal's prophets may tease you and circumstances may pour cold water on your plans. But look humbly to God. Call humbly on the name of the Lord and in that name do what God asks for you to do. And I promise you that God will carve out a channel through the embattlements of space and send down fire to light up your sacrifice. If he calls you to preach, preach like John the Baptist when they came to get him. <laughs> preach like John the Revelator when he was thrown in a pot of boiling oil. In boiling oil. John didn't boil, the oil was boiling, but John was cool. Preach as though there is a heaven to win and a hell to shun because there is. Preach like Stephen, that you may be surrounded by dry bones. Fix your eyes on Jesus and preach on. Leave the results up to God. They may throw stones at you for doing it, but believe me, keep looking to Jesus and you will see him standing on the right hand of God. And even though they may persecute you, they may ridicule you, they may say all kinds of negative things about you, God stands for you. God can make a difference in any situation, in any witnessing situation. God is there. You may be in the midst of a hopeless situation this morning, but nothing is hopeless with God. And so I want to close this message reminding you that God possesses the power to do whatever He promises for His people. At the moment, my husband is a pastor in Newcastle. He's serving in the Hamilton Church. It's a much smaller congregation than this. And uh, we've been praying, Lord, please grow this church. Help show us what we can do for you. Show us how we can uh, reach out to our community. And there was a young man who showed up at Hamilton Church. 
and he came through our food pantry, which we have on Thursdays, and he came to church one Sabbath, and then he just kept coming. And I asked him, I said to him, how, why do you, how did you find out about the church? And he said to me, I had a dream. And one night in my dream, I saw Jesus standing on the footpath outside the Hamilton church. He said there was light coming from the church, and I was walking along the footpath. And when I got to where Jesus was, he hugged me, he gave me a kiss on the cheek, and he told me that I could come in here and I would be safe here. And so he kept coming. He comes and helps in our food pantry. He goes door knocking with our Bible workers sometimes. Friends, he made a decision to be baptized and he's studying towards that right now. No situation is hopeless when we call on the Lord and we rely on what he can do. In closing today, I want to ask you, has the message made sense? And I wanted to ask us to have a special prayer today. I was going to ask you, and I will, make an invitation to you because I know that this sermon, I believe that God has spoken to every heart here today, but I believe that it's spoken perhaps to some more than others. Perhaps you feel like your life is a valley of dry bones and you want God to breathe life into your spiritual experience today. Or perhaps you are praying for another situation that you are facing in your family, in your home, and it looks as impossible as that valley of dry bones looked to the prophet Ezekiel. If there is anyone here who resonates with those two things, it may not be for everybody, but if you're sitting in your seat today and you resonate with that, would you just raise your hand where you are? Praise God. I would like to actually invite us, those who raised your hand, to come forward, join me here at the front. And I'd like everyone else to surround us today because I want us to pray together for God to send life into our experience and for God to breathe life into those experiences. So would you come forward, those of you who want special prayer today, Nobody else needs to know what that's about, but we can pray here. And those of you who didn't raise your hands, would you surround us so that we can pray to get today for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives and for God to give us, uh, breathe life into to those experiences which we desperately need His intervention in. If you don't want to come forward, please feel free to stand where you are. But we need to pray together today for God to do something in our lives and in our churches, not what we can do, but what He can do. And uh, Pastor Ash, would you open with a prayer and then I'll just follow you after this. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we come to you here this morning. Father, we thank you that you are with us and that you have spoken to us, Father. The desire of our hearts, I know it's unique and it's determined by the context in which we live. But Father, there's one thing that we all need and that's Jesus. And Father, I ask and pray that the Spirit of the Lord that spoke, Father, on that day, the wind that moved upon those dry bones may move upon us, that, Father, we too may live, that we may have new eyes, that we may see, that you may touch our eyes with the eye salve that you promise, that you may give us the righteous raiment of your own character, and that, Father, we may no longer be lukewarm, but that, Father, we may be hot for Jesus. Pour your spirit into the lives of every single individual here this morning. You are acquainted with what they need the most. Father, I pray that they may be willing to be made willing. And Father, may you take them to the deepest places that they can go spiritually with you. May they prioritize you in Bible study and in prayer. Your word tells us that if we seek after you, you will be found. And we thank you for that promise in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord, we just thank you for your word and for the power of that word, that it is a living and a powerful thing. And this morning you have spoken to our hearts and we stand here representing different struggles, different battles. But Lord, we appeal to you as the life-giving God and we pray, Lord, that you would move in our dry bone valleys whatever they may be, that you would breathe life into our spiritual experience, that we would go from this day pursuing a closer and a closer walk with Jesus. And Lord, you asked Ezekiel many years ago, son of man, can these bones live? 
And we answer with Him today, Lord, You know. We trust You to do what You can do. And we leave the results in Your hands. And so bless us now as we go to the rest of this Sabbath. And thank You for feeding us through Your Word today. We ask these things and thank You in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. May God bless you. And I believe there is a potluck so we can continue our fellowship together. Um, as everybody is going back to their seats, um, we'll just have a, a grace for the, for the potluck that we're about to um, partake in. So... Um, for those that are, that are walking, you don't have to close your eyes and walk, but just, just bow your heads where you are. You can continue to walk. Don't worry about stopping. That's fine. Let's pray. Father, and we thank you for the food that you've given us, the spiritual food that you've blessed us with here this morning. And we also thank you, Father, for this, the, the, the physical food that we're about to partake in. Lord, we ask and pray that you may bless it to our bodies and also the hands of those that have prepared it. Be with our fellowship, Father, as we continue to connect and um, to fellowship together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.